What is web development? Website development is a catch-all term for all the work that goes into building a website. This includes everything from setting up servers, creating a markup of the website, network configuration, and CMS development. So everything in the process of actually creating a website is, comes under the web development umbrella. Also note that web development is not concerned with the design and layout of the website. Instead, it's focused on the coding and programming that controls the website's functionality. Okay, so all, most of the terms in this might sound like jargons to you, uh, like servers, markup, network, CMS, um, and we will, and you might have doubts like, what is a server? How are we able to access it on the internet? How does internet work? What is the difference between a mobile app and a website? Uh, etc. etc. And so this course will help you understand uh, each of these terms and uh, clear your doubts. But before that, we need to go back to our basics and understand a bit of history of internet and how internet was supposedly created. So let's go back in time and learn a brief history of internet before we dive into further concepts of web development. Brief history of internet. So now let's discuss exactly how internet was started and what exactly is internet. So before internet, there was no way two distant computers could communicate. So accessing files or information stored on other system was impossible. So in current world, if you want to access some information that is, let's say on your friend's computer, you will send a, some kind of request to that person. That person will receive a request on his or her computer and then send you the appropriate response right but if there was no internet this is uh, basically an impossible task so so by connecting two computers and forming a network makes it possible for one, com for one computer to send the request to other computer for information so now if we attach these two computers for some by some kind of cable and form a network then a computer can send request and via the network the requested information can also be sent right so for example this file was sent to this computer through this network and now imagine if we expand this network to a global level then any computer in the world can connect to it and exchange data this hardware uh, for example the cables and the computers that that form the global network is what is actually called the internet. So now that we have discussed what is the internet, let's discuss what exactly is the web. The internet allows multiple services like email, video calling, file transfer, etc. In general, what we have already used a lot. One such service is the World Wide Web, which is also known as the web. And the web is an information system enabling documents and other web resources to be accessed over the internet. So internet provides multiple services, allows us to provide multiple services. One of that services is the web that allows us to basically access or enable uh, documents to be sent or other web resources like music, uh, images to be sent over the internet. So web is just a part of the internet services. So now that we have discussed what is internet and what, what is the web and now if I define the term website, it will be a lot clearer. So what is a website? A 
a website is nothing but a collection of files that we are accessing through the internet these files are stored on computers called the servers which are connected to the giant network called the internet these files are called web pages which are written in a language called html whose full form is hypertext markup language so website is just a collection of files and each file is called a web page and a group of file those web pages is called a website which which we can access over the internet simple right how the web works understanding how the web works means getting a simplified view of what happens when you request to view a website on your computers or your phones browsers web basically uses a client server architecture so what's the client server architecture let's discuss the computers connected to the internet can be called clients and servers they interact with each other by sending requests and response client computers sends requests to the server via the internet and the server processes that request and send response data to the client so this is basically what we discussed in the brief history of internet section where we were able to send request and response via the internet uh so client server is basically that if we we can label the client as someone who is asking for some information and server who is sending that response according to that request so what are web servers web servers are computers that store these web pages and sites that we want to view it processes the request from the client and accordingly sends back the response with the web pages to that client so web servers are the servers in the client server architecture and they have the ability to process the request that we uh, enter through the browsers and then send back to the client and in the next video we'll discuss what is exact exactly the client web browsers web browsers like chrome safari are softwares available on the computers and mobiles act and they act as the client to access web on those devices web browsers are also called web clients when we want to view a website for example google.com or amazon.com the browser sends request to their servers and the web pages are downloaded from that server onto the client's device the browser then converts those web pages uh files to actual view of the website so when you request a website uh this the files of that website uh in so called web pages are downloaded onto the client's machine and the browser actually renders those uh files into the view that we uh, are able to see on our browsers what is ip address an ip address is a unique address that identifies a device on the internet or a local network ip stands for internet protocol which is a set of rules governing the format of the data sent via the internet or the local network an ip address is a string of numbers separated by periods ip addresses are expressed as a set of four numbers an example address might be like 142.250.67.1 to which is the ip address for google.com each number in the set can range from 0 to 255 uh, so the full ip address addressing range goes from 0.0.0 to 255.255.255.255 .255 .255 .255 .255 .255 .255 
so what so in simplified terms ip address is like an address like we have our addresses of our house so if you want to invite somebody to your home you will give that person the address or the location of that of your house so ip address is a location of any device uh, maybe it be client or the server uh, and using this ip addresses the device is able to actually use the internet to request or send send requests or response to that particular device what is dns dns or the domain name system is like the phone book of the internet now we as humans access any website by typing in the domain name like google.com or amazon.com and now the web browsers interact through the internet protocol addresses that we discussed earlier so dns translates domain names to the ip address so browsers can load the internet resources each device connected to the internet has a unique ip address as we discussed earlier uh, which is a, which is which helps us to uniquely identify machines and find devices uh, the dns server basically eliminate the need for us humans to memorize those ip addresses such as 192.168.1.1 so it's it's actually hard for us to remember these numbers to access any website now what dns is does is saves a human readable form against this ip address now let's understand this better in the next diagram so this is your browser and we type in amazon.com and this is like a dns server in the bit in in, in middle and it stores like a key value pair uh, relation between the actual ip address and the domain name uh, in this example amazon.com it will translate amazon.com into the actual ip address in numeric form and then forward the request to that server and then send the response back to the browser hope this is very simple now after looking at the diagram website versus web apps now let's discuss what are the differences and if there are any between a website and web apps and we use these terms interchangeably a lot of times so website is a collection of one or two or n number of related web pages as we discussed earlier those web pages contains text images videos audio etc it contains static content mostly and it is it's mostly read only it's very interactive it's not a very interactive experience for the users and examples could be like wikipedia blog or companies official website um so so website is a term that is generally used for a website that has more static content in it uh, and prime example is wikipedia for example um now wikipedia when you open it's just a plain old document that you can read there's not much interactive features in it similar is the case with the company's uh, landing page website now you cannot change or basically do a lot of things uh, on that thing but it's just uh, information laid out in front of you now in so now what are web apps so web app is short for web application uh, which is built with a combination of client side scripts and server side scripts to provide a much more interactive experience for the user it's it feels like a desktop app or mobile app when you use it through your browser the content in the web apps are dynamic and also could be modified by user web app uh, mostly have a authentication like feature it is a very interactive ex experience for the user and some popular examples of web apps are like youtube google docs facebook etc 
so web apps are quite popular in our day to day lives and uh, it's it's quite apparent from the definition that uh, they are more interactive and have a dynamic content and also users can like modify it so uh, example prime example is youtube you can play a video back go back and forth like comment uh, in google doc you can basically write your own documents so it's it's uh, it's it has lot of scripts and logic running behind it uh, to provide that features mobile apps versus web apps so as we discussed earlier uh, what are web apps now let's discuss how it's different from mobile apps so mobile apps are software designed to work on your smartphones typically have to be downloaded on from play store or app store depending on your phone's operating system these applications provide a fluid experience and a lot of features as they have access to the phone's native features like gps camera calendar settings etc prime examples of mobile apps are instagram google maps photo editor apps etc so we a lot of us use mobile apps and there are also like softwares that can be downloaded on your phones and they have access to gps and phone native features uh so now let's compare the features side by side with the web apps so mobile fr- on mobile friendliness both web apps and mobile app are mobile friendly and mobile web app can be designed like responsive so that it fits the mobile mobile dimensions uh for user base so mobile apps are less accessible to most of the people example being because it is os dependent so uh, a, a app has to be compatible with the version of the operating system so if an app is built for apple it cannot be used on android so it's less accessible and not everyone uh, can use it uh on the other hand web apps are highly accessible as they do not uh, require uh, they are not dependent on os they work only on phone with browsers so if you have a fo- a browser on your phone which most almost all the phones have then you can access a web app and it is not dependent on whether you have an apple phone or android phone or a, or a or a micros or a or windows phone and based on features so the mobile apps like obviously provides a lot of features because they have access to native phone features like we discussed earlier gps camera settings etc and web apps so they also provide a lot of features but not as much as mobile apps uh, so based on performance mobile apps can offer good performance web apps also perform and provide good performance but not as much as uh, mobile apps uh based on space uh, some mobile apps use a lot of space on your phone's memory um and they have a they 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 require some form of storage capacity on the other hand web apps they don't require any space because they run on your browsers and as you exit a website or a web app the the cache is deleted so they don't require anything uh, any capacity of your phone storage uh offline access so mobile apps can be used offline because they are downloaded on your phone and even if the internet is not uh available on your phone for a moment then also mobile apps can be used but web apps since they are used uh only on browsers they cannot work without internet desktop apps versus web apps so desktop apps are software designed to work on your computers and laptops if app is available for a computer's operating system then user can download it and use it these apps offer are very powerful have very powerful features 
as they can utilize your computer's hard disk, RAM and CPU etc. Examples of such uh, powerful desktop apps are like Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop and video editor apps uh, and Microsoft uh, 360 apps like Excel Sheets etc. So desktop apps are uh, apps that are designed for desktop uh, that can be downloaded on your computer uh, and they have access to your CPU, your computer CPU and RAM. So they have the ability to uh, run highly compute extensive task like uh, Photoshop or a video editor. So now let's compare those features side by side. So if you built a desktop app, it won't be mobile friendly, but a web app that is designed for a desktop can also be designed for uh, mobile friendliness. So same web app can be used for mobile and on desktop. Uh, so that is a plus point. So and based on user base. So desktop apps have very less user base because not everyone has access to desktop or a computer. And uh, even if they have the access, the, the, the mentioned desktop app can only be downloaded if the operating system is compatible now if uh, now in ba on based of on for web apps the user base is huge as they only run browsers and they don't uh, require any they don't they're not dependent on any operating system uh, and most of the desktop have browsers so it's a huge plus point based on features yes so desktop apps also provide a range of powerful features as they can access the computer's cpu uh, for highly compute extensive tasks now web apps also offer almost all the features as a desktop apps but uh, if, if if it's a very compute and in intensive task then web apps will lag so uh, based on performance desktop apps have are very uh, high in performance uh, web apps are comparable to desktop apps but not as good so based on space so desktop apps will require a lot of system storage cpu capacities on the other hand web apps will not require any storage space as they only run in browser and will require minimum CPU. So for offline access, uh, so desktop apps will uh, offer an on offline access features because they are downloaded on your desktop, but uh, the web cannot work without internet. So welcome guys to yet another module about HTML basics. In this we will learn about what is HTML, why do we use it, what are different components of it and we will also implement it live, learn through examples uh, and create a web page. So what is HTML? HTML is a language for describing web pages. Uh, we discussed a whole lot about web pages and HTML is a language that is exactly used to create these. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. A markup language is a set of markup tags. Uh, now we'll also discuss further about HTML tags in the upcoming lectures. Um, and HTML documents are also called web pages. So now let's discuss about what are HTML tags. So HTML tags are the markup tags. These are the main components of a HTML page that create it and an HTML tag is a keyboard that is surrounded by angle brackets now this tag there are multiple tags in HTML and each tag will have its separate purpose now there can be a tag for an image there can be a tag for a paragraph there can be a tag for a heading but all Will follow a basic template which is the keyboard surrounded by angle brackets and uh, 
both of the tags are in pair and the first in the pair is the start tag and the second the forward slash is the end tag and in between them goes the actual content that we want to render on the page Our tags can also have attributes to define the properties of a tag like for this example i've given the tag name and the attribute id test so don't just discuss about the basic structure of an html page the basic structure of html page follows like this now html tag is the root tag for all the all html documents everything of a uh, in our page is is under this root tag called the html tag um, and it further has two child tags called the head and the body tag so the head tag is used for describing the data about the website it is not exactly visible to the user but it describes what the site will have what are the files it will have title of the of the web page that we see in the tab in the tab of a browser and the body tag is what actually holds the content of the web page that we see on the screen the images the paragraph text and the videos now this structure will follow any structure in html will follow a tree like structure i can see the the root html tag will have two uh, other child tags head and the body the head will have two more further um tags and the body will also have further more um uh, tags like paragraph and image and they can also have further child tags now this all might sound very confusing if you are someone very new to web development but we will in the next lectures implement it and create a web page uh it will be whole lot clearer uh and let's jump into it setting up the development environment now, this is very important for any coder who is just starting out the journey learning any development language and we to start our development journey we need the right tools the most important tool is a good code editor so for any web developer the visual studio code is a very good option it's free and it's uh, it supports almost all the use cases that we want uh, when doing web development to install visual studio code you can go on to this website uh, code.visualstudio.com and it will give you the options to download it according to your operating system it supports all the popular browsers uh, open systems like windows mac os and uh, linux as well so just download it it's a very simple process uh, i have already installed it so i'm going to do it again uh, after you have installed uh, the studio code you can create a file in the html uh, in a folder and open that folder in visual studio code so now let's so i'll go to this my files and uh, I'll create a new folder let's call it web dev course and in that uh, so let's let me open it first in visual studio code now in this uh, folder you will have these options uh, add a new file, you can add a new folder, uh, refresh the explorer, and you can collapse. So, we want to add a file and we will name it index.html. So, a thing to note is that the name of the file can be anything, but the extension should be .html because when we open this file in a browser. It will it will be rendered as a web page 
and now that we have discussed earlier uh, about the basic structure of a web page now we can write that now the the best thing about uh, happy novation studio code is that you can you can see your code very clearly uh, rather than a normal text editor so if i write html uh, and then next step would be is to add a head now if you can you can see like as soon as i write head it automatically auto completes um, the end tag for me so that's how um, a good code editor will help you write better code uh, in the head we can add title the title of our web page will be first page And we've discussed we have a body tag and in the body you say hello world right now that we have written a basic HTML page we'll go on our folder and we will open it with the browser that you have so if you open this you can see it is loaded in our browser with the location of our profile and we have the text hello world and also the title first web page pretty cool right so that was it for uh, setting up a development environment in the next slides we'll discuss various components of a web page thank you now before we start our HTML implementation of creating a web page. I would like to show you what the final version of our web page will look like. So this is so we will be going to code uh, a web page about a code academy, and uh, so let's go over the components. So it will have a header uh, with the kind of a navigation tab to go to different section of pages, and if we click about us, we'll go to about us. If we go to click courses, we'll go to courses and uh, then we have a, like a banner image and then a section for about us and uh, then list of courses that we'll offer it's in a form of, form of list and we'll learn how to create nested list and an ordered and ordered list next we'll also implement a table to show all the pricing plans for our course and then we'll create a form to get the name email age uh, date of birth uh, etc about uh, about the user before they sign up and then we'll create a footer at the end so this is about the project and now let's dive into how to create this page so now so now let's discuss about html heading tags so html heading tags are very popular uh, and almost all the web pages you see have some kind of headings now let's see how these heading tags look like. Okay. So now I've already uh, written a basic HTML heading tags. So, so, so now that you see, these are there are six headings in our in our web page, and each have different font weight as well and font size now what does that mean so there are six levels of headings uh, in in HTML h1 h2 h3 h4 h5 and h6 now h1 these all levels describe the prominence and the hierarchy of heading in a web page let's suppose you're about to write an article uh, and it has some subtopics and each subtopics have all the subtopics now the top level of the title of the article will be in h1 and the subtopics title will be in h2 and so on and so forth it's not necessarily based on how big the font is because you can change the font size and we will also see that later in the course but 
it's more important to pick the right heading according to the prominence of that section hierarchical section so for our code academy let's change our heading to code academy and uh, since this is our first heading we'll write code academy yeah, let's refresh code academy yep that's it sorry yeah so now we have a code academy title as well as heading for our first page so now let's learn about html anchor tags now anchor tags are very 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 useful because the whole concept of web is connecting web pages to another going from one site to another and that is possible to through anchor tags now each page on a website is a separate web page and you navigate between those web pages through anchor tag html anchor tag defines a hyperlink which is used to link from one page to another the most important attribute of anchor element is the href attribute which indicates the link's destination so the anchor is defined by a n closed in angular brackets and uh, its most important attribute is the href which holds the link that we want to navigate to so a link can be to your web page or it can also be between a section which is the intralink so let me show it through an example so here i have added two links so in any in any web page that you have used you have seen a couple of like navigation links like which tells us about us also add contact us right uh, and also add sign up okay so now for the first link I've added a href which has a link uh, called a web3 schools and with the label check resources now if i save this file and I reload my web page now you see that we have um, a couple of text in it and the check resources one is is looking like a link and as i hover over it my cursor changes to one hand so that's because it has an href attribute and which makes us a link and other don't have uh, so now what happens if I click on check resources and we go to this site which is called the Ruthie School which is amazing to learn and check resources about web technologies and I recommend checking it out um, but I hope this is clear like what the href does now you can change this to any link you can change this to change this to your own web page and link uh, your own websites other pages but there are also something that is called an intralink so this is an external link and this is called an intralink which I'm about to write so if I write so if I have section let's say uh, section And I gave it an ID of uh, let's say about us and 
I link it to about us. Also, let me add some divisions over it to make it clearer. Yeah. Now I've added a section called about us and uh, just have just notice what happens when I click about us. So if I click about us, check notice the URL. Okay, now it has a a hash called about us, which means we can we have linked, we have navigated to a particular section in our web page which has the ID about us now because the content is not so big it's not obvious and we'll surely use it in our sections coming up but it's a good example right now okay so let's change this um, also similarly with contact us and about us so these all will have our sections let's say contact sign up I think that's it for our anchor tag section Now, if you notice something that when uh, we wrote the anchor elements, they all came in same line. But when, but each H heading tag and also the section tag are in a new line. Why is that? That's because H1, the heading tags, are taking up a whole new a complete line space but anchor tag do not take the whole line these are called h1 is called block level elements and anchor are called inline elements now block level elements are HTML elements that starts from new line example like heading tags paragraph tags, section and a div uh, there are more block level elements but these are some popular examples some and also inline level elements are HTML elements that do not start from a new line some popular examples are anchor span and button tag so that is the reason that why all the anchor tags are in the same line and it's also an important concept of when we're about to style our web pages that we need to see what type of tag and how it is displayed on our web page uh, and then make the right decisions HTML image tag are an amazing HTML elements and are very very important because like in current scenario if your image if your website does not have an image people can attach negative meaning to it it just looks very bad so images are a very important aspect of any website uh, HTML image tag is a tag that is used to embed images in an HTML page. It is given by IMG and enclosed in a angular brackets. The image tag has, has two required attributes. The source which is used to specify the path to an image like from where the HTML 
document should get that image and the alt attribute which specifies an alternate text for the image if the image is for some reason cannot be displayed an example i've given this uh, so image source alt uh, and it also has width and height as an attribute now let's jump in the code and see it through a better example now if you see here i've added an image tag and right now i don't have any source but i've given an alt text to it if i save it and if i if we go back to our page and we see the check resources about us and we also see a banner image added now the thing to note is that banner image is added at the same line which means the banner image the image tag is also inline tag that means it does not require to start from a new line and also the image since we don't have an a valid image path the alternate text is taking over and showing a fallback text now for our code academy web page uh, we need a, a banner that shows a person using a laptop like learning something and uh, I think this fits our need it's pretty basic and if I open image in new tab and copy this path to it and in a code editor I paste this in our source And the image is embedded in our web page okay uh, but it's too bloated and too big now using the attribute uh, like okay so using our attributes like width and uh, let's give width I think 1500 so width is in pixels Let, let's make it more neat and uh, let's give a height of 600 let's say okay it's still big let's make the width to 1300 So height is still too big. So yeah, I think this is uh, good enough for now. Now since there was no space in the upper line, the image is shifted to the next line, and um, but it's still like an inline tag so to avoid this we'll add a br tag now br tag is like a break line and it adds a explicit line break of wherever it is applied so now if you see uh, nothing will change but if you add one more br so two consecutive break line tags now you see a, a added space between them so that's how you can add space and even if a tag is inline it's in inline element 
we can make it come to the next line using the break line tag also if you notice that the image tag does not have a closing tag also same case with br so these are called self closing tag self closing tags are tags that only have uh, that do, do not do not have a pair of tags and the first and it, it it ends with a forward slash and an angle bracket so that's it for uh, images about html uh, so pretty useful element and uh, let's learn about paragraphs in the next section now let us discuss about html paragraph tag it's a pretty simple tag and it does exactly what it says it is used to add paragraph in our web pages now let's see so this is a section that we were using earlier for about us and i've added a sec heading called about us in it and this is our paragraph tag it's written as p enclosed in angular brackets and it has a closing tag and all the content of the paragraph goes between so now let's see how it looks right now so this is our heading and this is our paragraph so uh, right now the we don't have an actual content of what we are about to write so let me copy some lorem ipsum fake text and if we go to our code academy then we see yeah so it's added like a paragraph now it does not look very anything new like it looks like a some sample text so let's just add another paragraph and uh, the use case of paragraph will be apparent so now if i reload then you see that there is a automatically a a gap between the two paragraphs now it is only possible when we are using a paragraph tag and uh, when we add a simple simple text without any paragraph then it will it won't have a division like this so it's always beneficial to use a paragraph tag when adding a text that we want to separate out html semantic and layout tags now that we have added quite a bit of content in our website uh, now we should think about organizing them in a better way so semantic and layout tags are exactly what our requirement is we want to uh, group our tags with the that are related to each other like if the header for the header tags we want them to be grouped as a header for our banner we want to group them as a banner if there is a footer we want to group them as a footer so semantic and layout tags helps us to uh, have a definite layout of our website and group uh, similar related tags in under them so html has several semantic elements that define uh, the different parts of web page uh, the the most uh, common components and layout of any web page is having a header a navigation area a section an article on a footer and now we will actually implement uh, this in our web page and group our tags into different layouts okay so uh, we have already added a section uh, previously here uh, so section is a tag that can be used to separate out a section uh, it's very uh, apparent from the name and we can give give a name id about it now let's create a header now if we add a header not head header and slash header then we have to move all of this content that is our heading and the navigation links into header 
and uh, since the navigation links are na are part of a navigation then we can bring them under the nav tab also since header is is a block level uh, element we won't need to add a br so let's just uh, see how currently looks so let me refresh and you see uh, there's no like much difference in it but uh, the gap here is bit more why is that because we've added two break line text break line uh, tags so first break line was to to break the line and come into next line and the second was to add a gap between the image and navigation but since header is in itself a, a block level then we don't need this first PR and just one BR to have a have a gap between so now if I refresh then you see now it's uh, better looking and now similarly we can add a new section and make it ID and add banner so these layout are very beneficial because it's it helps us to locate tags uh, that we want to supposedly edit in future because if it's all uh, cluttered and one after the other it will be very hard for us to identify uh, where to make changes so it's the best practices uh, that we should follow as a web developer and we already added a section for about us now we can add a, also a, a fit section for footer which we will later add um, and uh, we'll make it we don't need to require an id because it's already a footer uh, All right, now let's refresh. We have footer content. Uh, yeah, so that's all for layout and semantic tags. Uh, it it helps us organize our web page components better. Uh, now we'll add a section also in the next lecture about details of our courses. So let's say ID courses and uh, also let's add a section about sign up now we can add uh, the appropriate links for this section so we've already added for the interlink for about us now we can add for uh, courses courses and these are courses and uh, this fresh sf will be of uh, sign up yeah sign up now if i refresh and now if i code click courses it's changing the url right but since we don't have any content in it right now then it's not clear let me add a h2 heading courses Uh, H2 heading for sign up see uh, so now we have our courses this will be multiple courses and sign up and photo content pretty simple right uh, now let's jump on to the next section. Okay, welcome to another lecture. We will discuss about HTML list. Now HTML list as the name suggests is used for embedding list in our web pages. So these are a group of tags and there are two types of list which we'll look at uh, right now. So let's jump on to the code for the end of our discussion. So here I have uh, in the section of courses, we want to 
have a list of courses that we want to offer our students. So before that, I'll like to give you an example. I've added a sample list, two lists, uh, this one and this one. Now let's see how it looks on our web page right now. So let me split the screen. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So if I reload right now and uh, make the page more bigger so it's clearer. So we have two lists, one, two, three, and uh, item one, item two, and three. But in this list, it's ordered as one, two, three. In, in this, we have, uh, it's ordered as a disk, right? So why is that? Because we have, for in the first, in the first uh, list, we have used OL, which means ordered list. So this is an ordered list in which in, in this means that each item in the list will be ordered uh, by some quantifiable value. So, and each list item is given by a tag called LI uh, and the, the value of that list item goes in between those tags. Similarly, uh, this is a unordered list is given by UL tag uh, and each list item is unordered means it it is denoted by a symbol rather than a, rather than a quantifiable value so that's why it has one two three and this has disk now if I add a type to this and uh, also it already gives me certain options I can select a if I save this and refresh my page, now my ordered list items are ordered as A, B, C. So we can also choose different type of ordering uh, we want. And if I choose um, I and I refresh my page, so now it gives me Roman numer ordered list. So these are certain attributes. Uh, type attribute that you can use uh, depending on a use case. Similarly, uh, for an order list, if we go to type, then this can be circle. And if I refresh, then you see uh, by default it was a disk, but now it's a circle. And if I change this to disk and then I refresh, in second disk. It can also be a square. Oh, typo. Okay, uh, my bad. So now it's a filled square. Uh, pretty cool right so depending on use case you can choose any ordering uh, but for our use case it's not valid so let's add the actual list that we want to display about our courses so uh, let's create a list oh well and uh, this will be an order list so the first first will be an order list and the list items, so let me just remove these first. First item will be front end. Second item will be back end. Courses, back end courses and DevOps courses. So yeah, so we have our courses, front-end courses, back-end courses, and DevOps courses. Now, what if we want to add a sublist to a list? Can we do that? Let's see. So we've already, our, our, we've already added our front-end courses. Now let's add, now let's nest our list. So how can we nest? So let's add an ordered list this time. And uh, in this we can add li and 
uh, let's say HTML, HTML, and CSS, and uh, the next course will be about JavaScript. And the third course can be about React. So now let's check uh, how does it look. All right, pretty cool. So now we have listed nested our list into one another. Uh, let's do this for other section as well. So let me just copy it this and uh, let's say for backend we want to learn about Java, SQL. And let's say Scala. Now let's for write for our DevOps courses, and uh, in DevOps course we'll study about let's say Jenkins, um, CI, CD, and uh, let's say Travis, Travis CLI. All right, so now we have our courses and also we have nested uh, our lists to exactly say what type of what course topics that we'll study. So I think this is pretty good uh, introduction for us all in list. Uh, and we've learned about how to write ordered and order list and also how to nest the list. Okay, so now that we have covered a lot of things about list, paragraphs, images, now let's discuss about HTML table. Now, HTML table are very, very uh, useful elements of our, HT, of our HTML page uh, because it helps us to visualize complex data in an organized manner. So let's uh, look and code out and then see how a table is created in HTML. Uh, so, so for in this in, in our in our project, we want a table uh, to have to 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 show our pricing. So let me add also uh, a heading called pricing. Uh, it's an H3 heading because it's under our courses. All right, um, and to embed a table, we have to wrap a table content around this tag the table tag and everything that and all, and now we can use uh, more HTML tags to create a table. So table is basically if you look at it is a list of rows and each rows has cells aligned with it. All right. So to add a table row, we first need to add a tag called TR, which is short for table row. Uh, and now it, it will create a row and inside this we can add a TD tag which is used to describe a cell. Now in a, in a table let's say we want to have a header called plan and then we want to have a pricing and then we want to list the benefits. So this is kind of our header for our table columns now if i refresh and see then we have plan pricing and benefits all right um, so it's not very clear because it's a single row so let me just copy this and add another row now remember we are adding a row so this this new row that we add will be placed below this so let me just save and and uh, yeah, so you see plan pricing are aligned below each other. So if you want to have a separate data, let's say you want to have a free plan and uh, the pricing will be dollar zero and benefits will be um, access to any one course. So for free, you'll see you can access any, any of one course. And 
so we want to add another plan which is a monthly and let's say it's ten dollars a month and access to all courses and our last plan would be so let's say yearly now we want to have a yearly plan and the subscription amount will be dollars a month a year okay and it's access to all course again so let's just refresh and boom uh, we have plan pricing benefits and below this free plan monthly plan yearly plan with their prices and benefits okay so this is very really nice but the problem is that the plan and pricing and benefits do not look as differentiated so if i so table has also has a table head tag which is which helps us to enclose our table header now if we move our header row into table head and since it's a table head we want we have to replace it with the another tag called th which is for table head and also the closing tags now if i refresh and if you see now it, it is also aligned uh, in the middle and have a slightly bolder font than the rest of the tag table all similarly we have a tag called t body now these tags are used for grouping and does not have any feature with them but it's benefit it's 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 the best practice to use these to better organize your code okay so uh, we have a separate table header section and now we have a table body section as well uh, and just refresh it and now that uh, and that's all for table uh, right now so pretty interesting right uh, we have discussed about how to create a table how to add a header and uh, how to add different rows and align the table cells with it HTML forms so HTML forms are a group of tag elements that are that provide features to embed forms in a HTML web page now having forms in a page are really 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 important because this is what brings interactivity in our web page through forms you can get data of through uh, input from the user and send it to your servers so forms are really really crucial part of a web page so form tag is the container for all the form fields uh, input tag can be displayed as a text field a radio checkbox depending on the type at attribute so the form and the label tag is used to defining the label for the fields so the form is like the container of all the fields input tag is used to add text field or checkbox or radio or any type of field that you want to have and to attach a label to those field you need the label tag now let's go into the code and implement it practically to understand it more so we have our web page like this right now uh, and to add a form I'll add a form tag and this is our container tag for form and in form let's add a label for let's say name all right now i'll add an input now if you see i've added a type is equal to text which will be which, which will make it a text field um and name i'll say the name is name so what name attribute does is it is used for referencing the value of the of the data that is filled in so when we will submit the form the value that the user inputs let's say the the user inputs 
uh, his or her name and that is uh, max let's say now the name now when we send the form data to the server the name max will be attached to the key name this will be a lot clearer when we see how to submit a form uh, but for now uh, let's see how this looks so if I save this and I refresh my page you see we have a name and a text field attached to it and I can write name in it like let's say max all right now let's add another field label now we want to enter get the user's email and we add another input now if you see the it's already recommending me uh, certain attributes so I'll just press enter and uh, type is equals to email so now we have we are implementing an email type field uh, and name is also email in this okay let's save all right so now we see that it has it is not quite the layout we desire that is because label and input field are inline tags which means that they will not start from a new line so we will have to explicitly add a br tag to make the line break and now we have let's add another PR to have some gap and yeah now it's more readable let me also all right so but how do we attach so for for label to work we have to add a for keyword in this and the for keyword will have the value that will link it to the to its respective field and to uniquely identify this field we have to add a unique identifier so let's say we add name because it's a name it's a field that is required to add name and the for should be equal to the id value of the input name now this is helpful for the screen readers if uh, somebody is using screen readers to access our web page similarly for this we add form attribute and make it equal to email and add an id equal to that email now if we refresh there's nothing change on the field but now it's linked to uh, that input field now if we try to enter max and if we try to enter let's say also max now if I hover over the hover over the text field you can see there's a warning that please include add that in the email address because we have declared the type as email the HTML of the browser automatically recommends us the proper warning for this. So let's add max at the rate um, gmail.com. Now, if I hover over this, no error is showing, right? So, if you follow the rules and the best practices, the work is easier for us. Now, let us add a field to get the age of the user so let's say we make the age and the for age and we also make the id age and the type here will be number because the age will always be a number and now if i refresh you can see when i hover over this age field we already get a uh, a controller to increase or decrease now if it increases it will give us the increase number or decrease number depending on the button I click and if I try to type a text I'm trying and trying to type a non numeric uh, character 
it's not allowing me but if i type 12 it will allow me so that's how a number field works now let's add uh, now let's let's add a button and try to i'll try to show you how to how the submit works now if i add an input and i make the type equals to submit and save this form and uh, also let me add a br and if i refresh now you see we get a, a button and if we go to full screen let me refresh this again let me add some value let's say max and then max at the rate uh, gmail.com and let's give us an age of 25 and now if we sum it now you see that the form automatically submits or redirects to a page with this URL and uh, values attached to it now right now we don't have a server-side logic to get these details but if we did have a backend that is connected to our server this details will, fall, will be saved to the, saved to the backend now if you see the name is equal to max what we typed in and the email is also equal to max uh, and encoded at the rate gmail.com and the age is 25 so that is how name and value works together when we add it in our attributes okay. so now we have come to our last section of our html and we'll discuss about a tag called div now div tag is very very popular it does not have a it does not have a particular feature attached to it it's just used for creating divisions it's a block level element now let's jump in the code to see what is it can be used for so in this we'll create our footer and uh, right now we don't have much in our footer we just have footer content um, let's say for our footer we want to add some type of social links right let me split the screen and i'll create and we can have like anchor tags like i'll write div and i'll add uh let's say a p let's say i've had a I'll add a text p uh actually never mind let's add a follow us text and add couple of anchor tags like facebook if i copy let's say linkedin and let's say twitter now we don't have actually a link so let's just add href to dot Facebook Facebook dot com. Also add a href to LinkedIn dot com. Can also add a href to twitter.com now if we refresh this and now we have a footer uh, with certain links now if you see like division is adding no value to it let also add a tag called hr which is like which adds a horizontal line wherever it's added so if, if i refresh then it's like added a horizontal line so we can divide 
we can see a clear division between us between our, between our photo. Now let also add a div. Let's say all rights reserved. So div is usually for creating divisions in a particular section and this is very useful when we are actually styling our, our, uh, our web page because in, in when styling we have to create cards, we have to create certain divisions to add certain styles to that part. Um, so division, so div tag will be much clearer when we discuss about the styling part of a web page it's the it is the most used tag in when you will actually start working as a developer uh, so, so right now i think this is a pretty good introduction for div and uh, we learned about what div does and about creating divisions and we now have a footer as well Hello and welcome to everyone in this module about CSS basics uh, in which we will learn about how to style our web pages and add some some colors and uh, better layout of a website because we in, in the earlier module we build a basic web page with just HTML and this, that's not how we want our actual website to look like right so we will learn about what is CSS and how we can use it so so what is CSS? Uh, CSS stands for cascading style sheet. Typical CSS file is a text file with an extension of .css and contains a series of commands or rules. These rules tell the HTML how to display the HTML. A style sheet language, uh, it's a style sheet language uh, which is used to describe the look and feel of the web page. It provides an additional feature to HTML. It generally is used with HTML to change the style of the web page and user interface. So basically, CSS is like a styling language for HTML. But uh, so why CSS? Because it separates uh, the structure of our page, which is given by HTML from the presentation. It helps us load the page faster because if we write all the style also in same page it will be slower and for every page you have to load the same CSS file. It is easy to maintain uh, for multiple pages. It's easy to maintain for multiple pages. That is because CSS if written in a separate file will be beneficial and can be reused by multiple HTML pages. It provides better accessibility for disabled so if there is someone who is let's say colorblind or has trouble understanding certain uh, visual aspect of site we can use CSS to improve that and it's very easy to learn because it's not exactly a programming language but set of rules a CSS syntax typically looks like we, we provide a selector to it and then use a uh, curly brackets and then using a key value pair we provide a property which can be like a color a background color what type of font width height etc and then provide a value to it so this is a basic selector and we will learn about how to create selectors and uh, we also will learn about how to combine these selectors So now that we have a pretty basic idea of what CSS is, now let's see how to actually implement CSS. So there are three ways to add CSS in an HTML document by inline, internal 
and external so inline is by using the style attribute inside the HTML element uh, internal is by using the style tag in the head section of our HTML page and externally is by creating a CSS file and then adding the link to that in our web page so inline CSS styling uh, the CSS is not attached to in the header but used directly into the HTML tag example like so in this case we don't need selector so in this case we use the style attribute directly into our tag and then provide the values uh, so this is not a good way because it will make our page load slower because all the styles in our styles are in the tag in the tag only and we will have to repeat ourselves a lot this is not a good way so let's get a better understanding by actually implementing so I'll just open uh, the code editor and uh, spread the screen so let's add a bit of styling to this header so I'll add the style attribute and let's say we want the color to be red and if I refresh now see uh, the color is now red and also the interesting thing is if we right click on this text and inspect then we can also see what properties uh, of this on this HTML element are added so we see color is red and we can also add more like we can say font size uh, to be let's say 10 pixel so it will make the font size smaller so this is a pretty interesting developer tool provided in the browser now let's get back to internal CSS styling so this is the way in which we can provide the styles inside a style tag and the style tag is in the header so this is example like we have added a header and uh, inside the header we have the h select h1 selector uh, tag selector and then we provide the properties and then we have the image and the properties so let's also implement this now if i go into the head uh, so let me split the screen again and if we go into the head and i add a style tag and then add a selector to select the h1 and then add color as red and then remove it from here and if i refresh it says if i say make it blue then yeah so we have blue color Alright, uh, also one thing to note that the inline CSS style will always overwrite uh, other styles. So if I make this red and if I refresh then it's red not blue because the inline CSS style will override all the styles. Now let's see uh, best way of adding styles through external CSS styling so in this we create a separate sheet of uh, with a file with the dot CSS extension and then provide it uh, through a link tag inside the head so this is the syntax of how to do it so we add a link tag and uh, make it a uh, provide and make it the link as a style sheet and the type text.css and the href to wherever the file is located uh, so now let's also go into a code editor and through this icon if you remember we can add style.css so we created a new file and in this we'll add h1 selector and add let's say color and this time we will make it Mm, yellow 
all right now if i add let me remove this inline css because it will overwrite now if i add a link Okay, uh, my bad. I added it in the inside the style tag, so we have to make it outside the style tag. Now, if I add a link and then rel style sheet and type equals to text slash CSS href and the path to our style sheet is dot CSS style dot CSS. Now if I save this and go back in our page, you see the color is now yellow. So we've linked the external style, style sheet to the web page. But what if I make this blue? Now if I refresh, now you see the, the text is now blue because we have moved the internal style below this so this is overriding our external style sheet so you have to be very careful while adding styles and how how it could be overriding your desired styles so that's all for uh, adding style sheets uh, in our pages we discussed about inline internal and external style sheets and uh, what are the precedence order between them and how to uh, write better CSS with external style sheets. Okay, now let's discuss about CSS selectors and what are the different type of selectors are. Now, element selector uh, is very pretty apparent, like using the HTML element name itself as a selector, like div and h1, uh, and it will select all the divs in the page. So this is not the best approach to have selectors, but might help in some cases. Um, now, uh, other selector is class selector. So using the class attribute as a selector. Now each HTML element has a class attribute, like it, uh, it has ID. So uh, like in this case, we have given a class container to the div and we can access it by adding dot uh, next to the class name and then the properties so it will select all the elements uh, html tags that has the class container with it the next is the id selector the same uh, the same as the class selector uh, the element with the id uh, will be selected in this. So we selected by hash and then the ID name and then the properties. So ID is for uh, when we know a particular element will have that ID, uh, then we can use the ID attribute. So in the next section, we'll discuss about how to combine these selectors to have more refined selections in our CSS. Now let's discuss about CSS selector combinations. Now this is a very uh, important thing to know because we usually want to have some kind of combinations to select the particular uh, element that we want to style. Uh, it's really that we will we will directly get uh, a simple selector. So so in the, so we'll take multiple examples through. So to select a particular element with a particular class or ID. So, so if you want to only style div with the ID banner, or let's say you want to only style a div with a class selector one, then we'll, I, we'll, we'll type the tag name uh, followed by the particular attribute selector like hash banner or dot selector one. Next is if you want to select any element with a with a combination of class. So let's say we want to select a div. We want to select an element that has both the class selector one and selector two. Now 
to combine these two select two classes we will write dot selector one and with attached to it dot selector two and then the property so it will only select those elements that have selector one and selector two class next is if you want to select a element uh, with a combination of class and id so let's say we want to select an element that has a class selector one and id selector two and that's uh, if we want to combine it then we want we will write the class name dot selector one followed by hash selector two uh, next is to select an element with a particular ancestor so if you want to uh, capture uh, or select a element uh, with a given parent or we want to select a child of a particular uh, tag then this type of selections are helpful so let's say if you want to select a p tag inside the div then there are two ways uh, that you can do you can you can you can either use a div space and the p and then the properties but you can also use the class so let's say it will select all the all the all the all the all the elements with the id para inside the selector class one so i think it's uh, it's it's a it's a very useful and we also see how to implement it in the in a in a in a project so in in css selectors uh, we can also use this to share properties so we can so if if we know that p or container or color or some kind of selectors share certain properties then instead of writing it again and again we can use uh, we can use a grouping mechanism to provide the property ones and that's it for combinations and selectors uh, it was a pretty interesting topic and we learned about how to uh, use multiple variations of selectors and uh, filter our selections for styles okay so after discussing how to select our uh, elements now let's discuss few common properties uh, so uh, common properties that we have uh, usually seen are background color width height padding margin border and float uh, and almost all the tags uh, have these properties and we can uh, add these styles to them now let's discuss about the box model a box model in CSS is a very important concept it's it is how every element in HTML uh, is presented and we can manipulate it so uh, any element in in HTML has these areas uh, and it's represented like a box so any tag has a content and around it is a border and the space between the border and the padding and the, and the content is called the padding and every and any space external to that border is margin so this might be very confusing let's go in our code and uh, the page to see how it actually looks like so if I expand the screen and I open Control shift I uh, our developer tools and I inspect this h1 tag now if you see then we can access and we can see a visual representation in our code uh, in, a, in, a, in a dev tool provided by browser so this area the blue area that I have just hovered is the content this is the area where all the image supposedly or the text will go the next area is the padding now there is no padding let me add padding to it so let's add padding 10 pixel 
Now if I add the padding and you can see it also was presented in the mod in the in the diagram. So this is the box for this for this H1 and it has a padding of 10. Now let me add also a border to it. Border let's say one pixel. To add the border, uh, we'll discuss. We have to be also add the solid. Yeah. So now it also has a border and the space between the padding, and this already has some margin because it's an H1 tag. Then it already has a margin with it. This is the mox model, and this is this is what we can use to actually manipulate the styles and create the layouts around certain tags. So common box model uses are add a border around the elements that we see that we saw, uh, create a space between text and images in the elements, make box visible or invisible or semi transparent, uh, also apply round corners, uh, box and shadows. We can also manipulate the borders to make it make them round and control the width and height of the content of the element and its boxes element so i think uh, this is, so far we have discussed about the box model and how to manipulate it uh, we also saw how to visualize it and uh, how to manipulate it using the dev tools and now in the next sections we will actually use our knowledge that we have learned so far to implement in our uh, code academy web page uh, and we'll style each section like header, banner, and the uh, about a section accordingly. Okay, so now we have a pretty good idea about CSS and how and how the selectors work, and also we have seen the box model. Now let's use our knowledge to uh, style the actual web page. Now first we will style our header. So let's just select our header tag and add a background background color and I want this to be blue right now. Now if you see that this is the most blue color, right? Uh, now I want a custom blue that will go with the branding. So let's just inspect the header tag and uh, if you open, if you click on the color then it will show us the option and I want this to be a slightly darker blue shade. Think this is better so this we can copy this uh, hex code for color and paste it there and if I refresh now then the color same but the text is not visible now we need to change the text color to white Yeah, so our heading is changed and also if you see that there is a gap between the header and the windows boundary you know why would be that so let's inspect again and we see that there is no margin or padding in the header but if we inspect further we go in the body so we see that body has a margin of 8 pixel even in the box model you can see that it has eight eight pixel margin around it. Now we have to remove this so that our all sections take up the full space. Now if I say now to add the style to the body, we'll select the body tag and we'll add the margin as zero pixel. Now if I refresh now and the section is extended to the full but still 
the color of the headings changed but not the link so let's inspect the link and see what's happening here uh, so so you can see the color is already provided by webkit link so this is done by the browser because it's a link certain type of styles is also attached to it so if we provide color to this white now it's white and we also said let's say we want to remove the underline so this is a text decorate so if you if you see this is a text decoration style property with the property underline so if we write text decoration then it will give us options and we want to select none and yeah so now uh, you can see for this particular anchor we have the white color and also no, no underline let's implement but if you see uh, it's 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 overriding here but not here so let's just use our knowledge of combination selector to select anchor so in in header we want to select all anchor elements to have a color white and text decoration none now if we go back in our page and we refresh and yep so all the anchor tags and links have no underline and color white which is much more visible so let's close this and minimize this yeah now if you see uh, we have pretty good readability here but it's still very clumsy and I want to have a bit of padding around header so let's add padding but we don't want to add so but we don't want to add the same amount of padding to the sides and the top and bottom so how to do that so when we add padding if we provide a singular value let's say I provide 10 pixel and if I refresh then it will add 10 pixel evenly in all sides now let's inspect our header and if you see the 10 pixel is added evenly around all the sides but it, it's actually it, you can provide four separate values for each side so the first is the top value uh, and for the top I think we want to provide um, let's say 5 pixel for the sides we want to provide uh, 10 pixel so this is for the right side and then for the bottom I want to provide 5 pixel and then for the left side I again want to provide 10 pixel now if I refresh if you see the top padding is 5 pixel and the side padding is 10 pixel but the gap is still a bit much that is because of our heading tag so <clears throat> so I think we don't require the top padding so let's just make it zero yeah so now that, that we have removed the padding Okay. Now it's a usual common pattern that you see that header and the links navigation tabs are in the same level and I also want to implement it here as well. But 
we know that header tag is a block level element and how can we add something next to it so for that we can change the display of this to from block to inline so let's just add a combination of header and h1 and with using the property of display as inline this will change the display from block to inline and if i save this and refresh it now if you see that the padding the gap between them went away but the navigation section is still below it that is because we are using nav as well so nav is also a block level element so we have to make uh, the nav as display inline now for refresh yeah so now both uh, the h1 and the nav are in line and in the same line but they are still too close uh, how can we make an element uh, align to a side of any section for that the property is float so I'll add a float property to it it's a float and it gives us a couple of options in the ID which says inline end, inline start, left, none, right, set, inherit, initial, unset. Now if I type select left, then it will make the section float left. So if I refresh, okay, I made a mistake, we want it to go right. So if I refresh, yeah. So now uh, our navigation is on the left like we wanted it. But it's uh, still up. Now let's inspect our navigation and see. Yep, so it's display inline, float left, and now we can add, uh, let's say, a margin of 10 pixel. That will make it, that makes this uh, align in the middle. So let's add margin 10 pixel to this. Now if we refresh, now this is exactly what we wanted it. So we have a pretty amazing header right now with the code academy and a navigation on the left. Now in the next section, let's style our banner. Okay, so now let's think about how we can style the banner. Now banners are, are pretty simple in this case and we have an image. So basically we need to style this image. And right now we have provided it an attribute of um, width 80 pixel and height 300 pixel but this is like very static how can we make it like uh, very dynamic like according to the page width uh, it should adjust its uh, its image width right because my laptop is different might be your screen is different and uh, somebody else's screen is different so how can we make this uh, dynamic we also discuss so let's first remove these width from here and add section slash banner and in this we need to style the image and we'll add a width of 800 pixel and height of 300 pixel 
So if you refresh, then you see nothing has changed. So our styles are working. So now let's add 100% width. Now 100% width, what it does is it will take the width of its parent and it so in this case the image parent is the section and the section is taking its the complete width of the page so image will also take the complete width of the page now if we refresh then yeah so now we see our image is stretched out to the sides but this also does not look good like we want some kind of pattern to it uh, or else what I should say is that we want a padding for all the sections like we don't want to be we don't want the content to be stretched to the sides so I'll add a section for a section a section we want the padding We just want on the sides not the top so we learned previously that we can write top right bottom and left sides separately but if we can also write we can also combine top and bottom now for top we we'll, so for top and bottom is zero pixel and if I provide let's say 80 pixel then this will be it will be applied to right on the horizontal axis to the right and left now if I refresh then all the sections now have um, a padding of 80 pixel almost and I think this looks good and I think we also want to apply the same thing to our header so let's copy this to our header as well Now if you refresh yeah so now our header also has the same padding so it's it looks much more consistent now uh, now if we if i make the screen small so you see that it's it's kind of responsive uh, and it's still like better than previous version one thing more uh, what if we want to not add this as an image but we want this to be at as a background now we can also add this as a background so let's say i remove so i remove this from the source of the html and in this we add section slash banner we want to get a section with the id banner and we add a background so like we add the background color we can add background image and to provide an image we also have to provide the url of that image so it's like this so this property background image requires a url that we have provided the same as that one now if i save this and if we refresh this okay so now we see that the alt tag has shown and the background is repeating in some sense so we also don't want this so let's just remove the image for now let's just keep this as a background okay so now we don't have the image so we have to provide width to it height to it let's add a height of 300 pixel to section so now if we refresh and yeah so now because we remove the image tag and the uh, section won't have any height but how do we fix this repeating image so 
we have a property called background repeat background repeat and we provided a value no repeat now now okay, if i can refresh now we don't have a repeating uh, background but it still does not look like a background like a background image right so to fix this let's uh, inspect a section and we see that it is applied as a background but it is not centered it's not stretched out so for this we can add a background size and provide and we have a certain property let's say cover if i save this and i refresh this now it's covering the whole width of our section now this looks more like a banner now if i make this contained so now it's contained so by default it was contained but if you make it cover yeah and to get the full image we can increase the height by a bit uh, not this one this height yeah so now we have a banner image like this now now what we can potentially do for the background image is that we can add certain text to it so let's say i add a h2 heading that uh, join join the best coding coding acad me yep so now we also can write over this image as a background uh, why is this gap coming so so we don't want the gap here okay we still have br that's why we have a space between them okay so if we now see that h2 is adding a bit of margin to our section right uh, to remove this what we can do is uh, in section we can add a padding now we can also add a specific padding like we can add padding top to uh, 20 pixel now for refresh yeah excuse me yeah so now we can add a padding and now the line is shifted below but it's better if we so but it's not visible because our image is this way so i think we should make this float to left as well and for this we can use uh, another combinator selector which is section and inside this slash banner h2 and we can make float to uh, right yeah uh, so this is h2 but this looks a bit small right let's make the font 
size so font size is the property that okay, we can use to change the font size uh, and now let's make this um, 40 pixel let's see how this looks yeah so I think this looks uh, much better probably an exclamation mark to be better yep so I think this looks pretty good now we have padding we have a background image and we also have a navigation now let's move on to the next sections okay so now let's come to our next section to style th that is about us now for this we want to it to align in the center uh, also same for the paragraph this should be pretty simple so in our style dot css let's add the style section slash about us the id and add uh, we want to target the h2 right so let's add h2 in it and make the text so this is a property called text align which will align the text in it so if you if you type text line it will give some options so center and justify left right start inherit so center will make the text go center in the end will make it go end end and uh, right will make it go right so let's add center and if we refresh then it comes in the center now for this paragraph we'll also make the center all right so now we have learned how to align a text content inside a container but remember for aligning a text the container should be like to the full extent and according to the extent of the container the content will be aligned and i think this is it for about a section uh, nothing much to do here let's move to our courses section so in our courses section uh, we also want the same thing we want consistency in our design so if we have aligned this to center we also want this to align to center so now let's capture section hash courses and for this let's also add h2 text align center for refresh our course is align center and uh, we also make want to make the list and the table also align center so let's make the selector and make so this is our unordered list so right so ul if i save and if I refresh oh uh, yeah so this is pretty messy so it aligns only text right now if we inspect this list you can see that li is extent to this complete width and inside this the text is line center so the text line is doing its job but we also want the items the number uh, with it right so uh, aligning text is not the right approach to use here 
so we want this you are list to be aligned in center so I think what we can do is maybe use some kind of margin so let's make remove this tile and let's make a margin and let's add a margin we can also add sorry margin and let's say lift and we want to add a hundred pixel okay so after adding a margin 100 pixel it aligned a bit now let's make it 500 pixel it's too much uh if you make it 400 pixel so this is i think you get the point so we can move the list uh to left using margin but having a fixed amount of width is not a good approach because the width can vary from screen to screen so what's better if we just add a 50 percent of margin which will take this according to the width of the of the container so now we make the margin 50 pixel so now what we see in the box model is that the margin is added but it also has padding due to it being a list for having the list list of bullet points so instead of adding 50 let's reduce it to 40 37 so almost 40 percent so let's make it 40 and yeah so 40 is much better so now we have aligned our courses in between so, and there is no division between so I think it's better if we add a, let's say section courses and background color to light okay for refresh Hmm. so I think we want this to be much more lighter than light gray yeah I think this is a good color so let's copy this hex and now I will paste this hex in the background color and if I refresh then it stays the same now it looks too much attached to the top let's add a bit of padding also so padding top uh, let's add a 10 pixel maybe yeah so i think 10 pixel is perfect so we also need to align this now let's copy this and add this as h3 now we are we are grouping these selectors so that we don't repeat ourselves and the pricing is also moved center and let's see what happens if we do the same thing section slash courses and table and we make text align to center yeah so this will only make the text align in the table center right so if I let's say I remove I comment this part and I refresh okay so we don't want this we want to make like the list is aligned in the middle we want to make this align the middle so let's use the approach we used for list and add a margin left to 50 percent and 
the same thing so we want this to be let's say 40 percent yeah so i think 40 percent is still better now let's also add a bit of padding to this so padding top and padding bottom still pixel perfect so so in this we learned about aligning text and also using margin to align certain things in middle uh, and text align is for aligning the content in the middle and margin can be used to align the element itself uh, on the position that you want okay so in the previous lecture we styled about us and a bit of course and we added the background color mm. and aligned content in the center uh, but as you see our table is structured but not clearly visible how the data is arranged because there is no division in between so so in this video, we'll, let's see how we can make our table better. So uh, to make our table style, we want to add uh, certain borders to it. So make the division clear. So let's add, so, so to target the cells, each individual cell will write TD and uh, Get, get add a border of and not to add a border we will we can provide three values separated by space and the first value is the border size which is one pixel also uh, the second property is how the border should be like solid or it can be dotted as well so it will create a dotted line as a border but for our case we need solid and then the color in our case i think black color is sufficient for now now if you refresh mm, oh i think i accidentally moved the previous styles so our previous style was section hash courses table and uh, our margin and we had the left margin margin left was I think around 40% yeah so we have added borders and now our data is much separated and clear but still it this has a gap and that does not look good now table has a property called border spacing which is essentially the space between borders of the cell which we can provide as any value let's say we provide it as 10 pixel on we refresh you see the divisions get got more broader so let's make it zero because we want it to be yeah close to there now it's better but the still the border is very close to the content so for that we have to add padding to our cells and let's say we add a 10 pixel padding and if i refresh yeah, so now it looks much clearer and much readable to the user and now since we have increased the size i think the margin needs to be 30 now oh not this one the table margin because we have because adding the padding made the table a bit bigger check yeah so 35% margin fits perfect 
now we have styled our courses we have styled our table and on the next section let's uh, also align our form uh, with the other pages Okay, so in this lecture, let's see how we can style our form uh, and let's jump in the code. So right now our form is like the middle and we'll follow the basic approach that we have followed. Hash uh, sign up, which is the ID of that section and the H2 is text line center yep now we have seen that uh, almost all the h2 all the h2 in the section are aligned center so it will be better if we can like make a generic selector for this and every section the h2 will be text align center and now we can uh, remove other text line center so h2 for this and we also have h3 so let's just copy and also add this to our for this one yeah it's so in section also in section H3. We can also remove this and we don't need this. But if we save, let's see. Yeah, still all the H2 headings are the same. So we have reduced our uh, selectors and code. Now let's try to apply the same style for the form. And let's say section hashtag sign up and let's say form text align center. Yeah, it kind of works. So text line center works for form on our case, and uh, we have a pretty good look form. But the catch is if we go in our HTML to have this spacing, we are using br tags. Now this is not a very good approach. Like we don't want to use br for for creating margins. So I think if we just remove the double br and just keep one br. Yep. Now if we refresh, the the form is still in a in in a in a vertical fashion, but they have no gap in between. So to fix this, let's let's uh, design our HTML in such a way that we don't need br for this. So we discussed in the earlier section about divs, right? So we can use div. We can use div and move our form label inside divs. Now div is or by default a block level uh, element, so we don't need br. Now if we refresh, you see that name is still uh, not like merged with other. Now if we repeat the same strategy. We create another div yeah so I think wrapping in divs is much better uh, this will help us in styling as well and adding margins because this way we can also click group our label and input in a single container Right. Not 
this all belongs to a single container just a bit of formatting to make our code more readable let's move this br now let's add another div hopefully it's the the last one We can also remove this PR. Now we only have this submit. I think this is sufficient. Now if we refresh, it does not affect any form, which is just what you want. Now we have wrapped our label and input pair in a div. Now how do we add a gap between them? Now what we can do is add a class which we can name as field right to signify that it's a form field or to be better let's make it form field to be more explicit now we can use this class for all the form fields So we have added a form field class to all our fields. Now this won't change anything, but now we can use this as a selector. Now if we write form dot form group sorry field, now we can add a selector. So we created a form. So we are selecting form tag uh, and its child. With dot selects dot class selector and let's add give a margin bottom of I think 10 pixel let's see how that looks now if we refresh and yeah it's much better now it does have gaps and uh, we don't have to use PR in it now if you see that the course interested in is uh, a lot of gaps so it's a it's a p so i think we can remove this padding because it's extra because we're also adding uh, the mar div margin so let's add form and we target p and make its padding or sorry margin as zero Yeah, so now it's it's much better also similarly the selector worked for plan as well now we have labels but this was also label and it's kind of getting merged with the there's no, there was no like visual separation between label and fields which can be confusing so we can target form label and or better we can target the labels inside the form field right uh, so here we are selecting all the class all the elements with the class form field and 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 any child with the tag label and we make the font so there's a property called font weight and we can use font weight to add the font weight as in numeric like 100 to 900 and we can also add it simply bold now if we refresh uh, yeah so now the labels are bold but 
what we forgot is that this is also label for this one so we wanted to style this and not this um, like similarly for this so we will create uh, another selector and uh, so let's see how we can differentiate this label from other labels Okay, so we can add another class in this and we can say multi select or what would be better okay so what would be better if we add a class let's say we add a class called form field label so all the things that are form field label that we want it to be styled like label we add the class to it and uh, similarly for plan yep that's it we don't add this to other now instead of getting all the labels we only get dot uh, form field label now if I refresh and now this label are not styled but this is okay much better so now uh, let's also style our button because it's kind of looking not that great so let's capture our form and uh, so our, 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 our input we can make it a class submit button and in the form we want to get the submit button class and add a padding let's say 10 pixel and we can also add a background color which will be equal to the ones we used before to make the style consistent and make the color as white now if we refresh yeah uh, so i think we can so we can add padding so we want to add only add padding to uh we want to add different padding so in the horizontal axis I think 10 pixel is enough but for the vertical axis I think 5 pixel should be enough so for this we can add padding like 5 pixel and 10 pixel now this 5 pixel will be added to the top and bottom and this 10 pixel will be added to the left and right sides yeah much better but this still looks very boxy and we want to make it slightly better looking and we also see a black line out there so let's just inspect this and see how what properties are acting on it so we see there's a border of two pixel and the border was not added by us it was by default so we can remove the border make it zero now if we refresh and now the border is gone and we now want to uh, make this a bit curvy so there's a property in CSS called border radius now border radius is is used to make these edges more rounder so if we provide a value uh, 
five pixel. Then the five pixel will be taken as a radius, and the buttons will be curved accordingly, like in this case. So now it's a much more elegant looking button. So yeah, so in this video we learned about how to style, how to use classes in a much better way, what are the uses of div and we also learned how to style a button and use borders uh, and border radius properties. In the next section, our last section, we'll discuss how to style the footer. Alright, so now that we have styled most of our web page, the header, banner, sections, courses, tables, forms. Now all that is left is footer. Now for footer, uh, I want to do something similar that put it for header. Like I want to have a background that is same theme blue color and font white. And uh, remove this horizontal line and actually use the footer border for division. Let's go back into code and since the footer style is similar to header, let's just add as a grouping for this. Now if we go back and we have this similar background color and also font color. Now for anchor, we'll have to do similar thing that we did for header. So footer and A. Now if we save and refresh. And yeah, we have the anchor also, uh, like same as the header. Okay, and now I think we can remove the horizontal line. So yeah, and now I'll add a footer selector and give a border top and uh, 5 pixel to make it visible add solid and uh, a dark blue color now if we save this and refresh now we have a division and a footer now I think the padding is a bit less so padding top 10 pixel and padding bottom also 10 pixel you can also use the pa simple padding property and provide it like this, but it's on the same thing. Yeah, then now we have a footer as well. And I think that's pretty much it for a basic footer. And uh, that's all for our section for our CSS uh, module. Uh, we learned about styling, background color, font colors, font weight, font sizes, how we can add a banner, how we can add a background image as a banner, uh, align content in center or left and right, how to style a table and how to align using margins and uh, how to use classes and div tag better to create selections in our web page so welcome back to another module on javascript basics so this module will help you start your journey learning javascript will cover all the basic concepts that you will need uh, as a beginner and to understand what JavaScript is and how it helps. So what exactly is JavaScript? JavaScript is a programming language that adds interactivity to your website. Uh, so earlier in our course on HTML CSS, we build web page, but they were not interactive as much. Like it was static content and there was not much uh, dynamic elements in a website. HTML JavaScript can be used to manipulate the HTML DOM and add complex logic on the client side. So it can also be used to manipulate the HTML DOM, the HTML 
tree structure that we uh, discussed in the HTML section and also add complex logic on the client side like if you want to manipulate data you want to do some mathematical calculation you want to uh, let's say there are series of numbers that we call array uh, we want to calculate value based on that so that our logic used to be on only on server side but with the help of javascript we can move that logic on client side as well it creates elements for improving site visitors interaction with the web pages such as drop down menus animated graphics and dynamic uh, and background colors so yeah so similar point like we have uh, our site uh, visitors in our site and to improve their interaction we can add dynamic content like drop down menus with animation animated graphics and also dynamic background colors but why exactly so do we need javascript so typically even a user request a uh, request to view a page a request is sent to the server and the web page is sent in the response which we learned in our web basics module so this is a user which comes to a browser and the browser then sends the request to the server and we get our web page which is an html page now then if let's say pause we perform any action let's say we submit a form on a click of a button then a request is again sent to the server and a different web page is loaded as a response so so to to bring that response page we have to again fetch another web page from the browser so javascript can help with the second request we can we can om maybe omit the second request to bring that response html page and perform some uh, confirmation logic with the help of javascript so that's how javascript can help us take off the load from servers and uh, bring instant and uh, instant confirmation on our site where does javascript code exactly run javascript code runs in the browser the browser has a javascript engine that can execute the javascript code so each browser has its own version of javascript engine and uh, which is responsible for running the javascript code in the browser so to give a demo of this uh, let's go into our browser and i have opened this console panel which you can open uh, by control shift or to inspect and then you can go into console and since the browser has javascript engine we can we can write javascript in the console as well so if you let's say write 2 plus 2 then it will uh, return 4 so this is through uh, this is a javascript code and if you like let's write uh, console dot log which is kind of a print statement in terms of browser and we want to say bob it, it will print the bob value we can also call all some other browser methods functions let's say we want to alert hello yeah so we have an alert which says hello so this all type of things that uh, the browser helps us through the JavaScript engine. Okay, so now let we have seen what is JavaScript, how it works in the browser. Now let's see how we can add JavaScript in our HTML page. So I created this basic uh, HTML folder for adding a web page with js basics and html file uh, fairly simple you have a body tag inside we have a h1 tag to say hello world and i've added a link uh, to our style sheet and right now the styles are also empty so it should be a basic page now if we go in our browser and we run the code so we can see hello world so to add javascript in our code we added in the browser at the bottom of all the content with the help of a tag called script and uh, let's say we want to print something um, 
hello world itself right so i'm not saving this right now so let's me first open the console and uh, it's better if we split the screen yeah so also let me split the screen so i added the added the script tag in which we can write a javascript and i've added a console dot log statement which will print the hello world in our console web page console so if i inspect now and open console and save now if i refresh yeah now you can see the hello world is printed and also tells us like in which line we have added the statement so it was our index html line 9 uh but this is not like scalable like each web page will have its own uh script and we cannot reuse it in other web pages so but the best practice is to add another javascript file with the dot js extension and if you write this it will automatically automatically show an icon of js and you can move this uh piece of code in your script and now you can add a source attribute in the source attribute will be your uh, location to the script file so if i save now and i refresh again and yeah so we have seen now let's add hello another print statement uh, let's say Bob or better uh, let's print a number this time so let's say 10 and if I refresh yeah we have hello world and we have 10 number as well printed so this is how you can add script tag now you might be thinking that we have added link in head but script in body at the below why is that it is because script tag is another file that can be huge in size and it will and the javascript browser will execute your tag line by line so if your script is too huge then no html content will be rendered unless the script is rendered completely so which will be uh, leaving the user uh, for a blank screen for a few seconds so it's always recommended to first load the html and then the scripts that's why it's uh, it's advisable to add script at the bottom of the body and then that's it so that's it for uh, adding script in html we learned about how to use a script tag where it should be placed and how to add a javascript file in html now let's learn about variables variables are like the first step to learn any programming language and uh, variables you can understand are uniform for any programming language that you will learn variables are the labels that we give to a memory location that stores some data variables can be used to access a data in a program the value that a variable holds can also be changed later in the code to declare a variable we use let keyword and then followed by the name that you want to give to the variable so if you see the example i've used let keyword and then the variable name it is my variable and which is equal to the value bob i want to jump in the code and see how it exact actually works uh, so i've also the same project uh, which is running the browser right now and i have split the screen yeah so this is the same example that we discussed earlier this is my my variable uh, which holds the value bob so data can be anything in a program it can be a string it can be a number we'll also discuss what type of data are there but anything that we want to store in our program can be you can be done through a variable now when we declare a variable using let keyword it just assigns this label to memory location and in that memory location the word or the, or the string bob is stored now to access this uh, 
variable we can simply write the name of the variable so let's say console.log and my variable now if we save and refresh then we see that the value is printed instead of the word my variable now we can also let me give you another example let's create another variable my var which will hold a value of n now let's add another console.log statement and uh, my var now if I refresh yeah so now you see bob and 10 also so that's how you can declare a variable and access later now there are some rules that you want to follow uh, for declaring variables uh, so the variable name cannot be a reserved keyword you cannot name your variable that is already a reserved keyword in javascript let's for example we've discussed about let now a variable name cannot be let now for refresh this and we refresh then yeah we get this uncaught syntax error that is not disallowed as a lexical bound name that is because let is already a reserved keyword you can also not use if like if you try type if it already gives you an error now if I refresh and use if yep yeah. uncaught syntax error and expected token if uh, example or more such keywords are like for And I think you get the point. And next point is that it should not have a space or a hyphen. So you cannot declare a variable with my variable. It's not allowed to have a space or even hyphen in the name. It will the ID the your code editor will automatically give you an error. Second is you cannot start with a number. So a variable should not start with a number. Like you cannot say my one my var but it can it can end with the with the number like my var one yeah so it's working fine and then next is it is case sensitive so let's say we declare same variable uh, again uh, and in this we make the v small so this my var has v capital and this my var has uh, v small now these both are separate values this is not same value so these are case sensitive yeah and we cannot also not 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 re really declare a variable again. So if I refresh, it will also give you a syntax error that identify my var has already been used. So these are some tech. So there, these are some certain rules and uh, for declaring a variable. Uh, we also discuss about what are variables and uh, one thing uh, is left to show that you can you can re declare a variable, but you can but you can uh, re we declare its value like uh, for my var we already declared bob now we can change this to uh, joe now if i console.log my var you see that it's joe you can also change the data type like you can also hold a number so it's not type specific it will give you 10 instead of bob because we changed the value Okay, after learning about variables, now let's discuss what type of data a variable can hold. So data types are exactly what the name suggests. It is the type of data that a programming language supports. So in JavaScript, we have broadly four, five uh, type of data, the string, number, boolean, array, and object. Now let's look into one by one. String is a sequence of text, uh, which is declared by enclosing a value in in in, in quotes uh, number uh, is a number and it 
it is not uh, enclosed in any string but in a, in a in a quotes but directly provided as a value now boolean uh, is a value that can hold a true false value so it's it is provided uh, so any so if a value is true and not enclosed in a quotes then it's a boolean value like in example you can see my variable true or you can also say false uh now array now array is a is a structure a data structure that allows you to store multiple values in a single reference so it is like a list of values that you can store uh with a reference with referencing to a single variable it is declared uh by enclosing comma separated values inside a uh, square brackets an object an object is also like a data structure that can hold a value uh, a key value pair data structure so in example you can see it is enclosed in a curly brackets and uh, a key with the colon and the value that it holds so this will be a structure where the name is the key and string bob is the value and age is the key and 10 is the value so it's also comma separated uh, between Uh, each value and key pair now it it might be confusing if you are um, a very new to pro programming but let's look at the code and see each data structure one by one now here i have already declared couple of uh, variables with each holding different data type so first is my string which holds a string uh second is my a number which holds a number second is my boolean which is holds a true value and uh, third is my array which holds a, a array a list of data and the first value is a number separated by a comma second value is a string which is bob separated by a comma second third value is a boolean which is separated by a comma and then fourth also a string it can also be a single value it can also be all strings it can also be all boolean it can also be all numbers uh second is my object which is enclosed in curly brackets and uh, has a key value pair separated by a colon its name is the key and bob is the value similarly for age and email now let's console log them one by one and see uh so let's say my number let's copy this my number my boolean my array and my object now save and if you refresh now then you see uh, each value is uh, printed line by line in the console the first is the bob string second is a number second is a true uh, boolean value third is an array so if you see uh, array it's a list of value printed all together at once not not just a single value you can also expand this and see that it has a key uh, also with it like an index so these are called index in an array so 0 1 2 3 are the index of this array so at 0 0th location we have stored 10 at first location index we have stored a string bob at the second index second location we have stored false so array starts from an index value 0 always in programming and uh, if you want to access the first element you have to access the index 0 instead of 1 similarly if you expand this object then it will also give you an key value pair uh, structure which is age and name email and uh, name now if you see that it is not in the order that we printed uh we declared name first and age second and uh, email third but when we have logged it it is age first email second and then name so the order is not maintained in object where in case of array the order is maintained all right so now let's dive type into Uh, like accessing more values in array so let me remove the other values 
and just work with array now if you have to access only a single element you can do this by adding a square brackets after the variable name and the index you want to access so i want to access the first value so which will be a zeroth index now if i refresh and we have 10 which is the first index now if i have to access the second value it will be one now if i refresh then we get bob now if i access want to access the third value sorry fourth value which is one zero one two three four so i'll have to write the fourth index and uh, sorry you have to write the third index yeah so now it's two so if if the value is not present it uh, the error id will throw undefined all right now let's uh look now array will also have certain properties that is come with it so you can look at uh, now if i put a dot x okay it's too big right now now if i put a dot after an array it will give me certain options like concat entries fill filter these are properties of an array that we can access and uh, and some kind of a like access any data or information about the array let's say i access length property now length will give me how big the array is now if i refresh it will give me four because our array has four values so the length of the array is four so you can discover uh, more about arrays uh, by looking at its properties and what each property does you can also if you're using uh, visual studio code it will give you what each property does now let's discuss about objects so let's print my object now let's say i want to access only name so similarly like to access any property of an object you have to add a dot after the variable name and then the uh, probably the id will also give you some options like what property it does have mm -hmm. so it's an age you can access email and so if i type age and i refresh then you can say we put it age now if i want to print a name then i've also printed a name the name property and similarly for email it prints the email so that's how you can create an object and also access its values so these are all the major uh, data types in javascript we looked at how to create them and how to access uh, individual properties if it's an array an object in the next lecture let's learn about certain operations that we do we, that we can do with uh, the data types okay now that we have learned about variables and data types now let's see what operators and operations we can perform with these data so there are five major operators that we should look at when we're starting uh, our journey with javascript there are much more operators that you can look into but these are the major that you should uh, know as a as a as starting out someone sort of starting out so the first operator is addition which can add two numbers or to combine two strings together for example we can do six plus nine which will give us 15 and we can say hello plus world which will give us a, a one string called hello world now uh, the third is like subtraction multiplication division which can only work with numbers and do the basic operations which they imply like minus multiply and divide now multiply in js is like an asterisk symbol not a x symbol assignment and now as you have already like seen this assign a value to a variable so this is this is also an operator in uh, javascript like we have seen uh, how to declare a variable with assigning a prop value to it strict equality this performs a test to see if the two values are equal it returns true false uh, boolean result as a result 
so if you want to see like if a value is equal to another value uh, then we use this triple equal sign to see the similarly if we want to see if something is not equal to something then this returns the opposite value of the proceed so let's say if you want to discuss if you want to um, if you let if take this example my var equals to 3 now 3 var my var has a value 3 now if we add this operator like not equal equal now my var value is actually 3 but since we have added not then it will be false value okay so this might be confusing uh, so better we jump in our LD ID and uh, see with the demo so I've created two numbers num1 and num2 now I'll add a console.log to add num1 plus num2 I have 30 so 10 plus 20 is 30 similarly if I add two strings I can console.log and say string1 plus string2 Now if I refresh, we say hello world. Now hello world does not have any space because it's the string itself does not have a space. So it will concat these two strings. So to add a space, either we can have a space added like this in hello and uh, now the hello world will have a space or we can add perform an operation and add a space with adding three strings together like this now if I refresh we also have a space so because we added a another string while concatenating now if I uh, show you the not sim not operator so bool1 if I just log bool1 then you see the value is true but if I add a not symbol uh, before it, then the value will be false. So the so not symbol, the exclamation mark, returns the opposite of the of the preceding value. Or similarly, if we if I want to give you a demo of equality operator and uh, num3 and num1 has a same value 10 and 10. If I say num1 equal equal triple equal with num3 then it will return uh, true. So, right? so if I this are true so let me just uh, remove the other consoles to avoid any confusion. Yeah this returns true. Now if I add a not with it then it will check if then it will check if the value is equal to it and if it's a true then it will turn false it turns false but if i let's say add num1 and num2 now num2 is a uh, 20 holds a 20 uh, number 20 and 10 and 20 are not equal so this will this equality should be false and that is why if you add a not it will return true Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now similarly you can also perform this operation with string. Now if I add string 3 equal equal to uh, string 1. Now this will be true because string 1 3 and string 1 both hold the same value hello. Now if I add a not to it, then it will return false. So this was pretty interesting. We wrote our first logic, you can say, and uh, which, which, which we can use to uh, perform addition and subtraction values also. And we can also use assignment operators uh, and also check equality with operators. Now in the next lecture, let's discuss about Alright, now let's learn about conditionals. Conditionals are a code structure. 
used to test if an expression returns true or not. A very common form of conditionals is the if else statement. Okay, so conditionals are are code structures that we can use to run a piece of code only if the expression returns true. Now this will be confusing, uh, so it's better if we jump into code right away. Now if I have to create a, a program that prints uh, my flavor is vanilla or that only prints certain things if the flavor is vanilla. Okay, so if I add my flavor equal equal vanilla, okay, then console.log. Yes, the flavor is vanilla. All right. Now if I run the code, then it prints, yes, the flavor is vanilla. But if I say, if I put a not and uh, sorry, uh, if I if I change the value, let's say I put chocolate. So my flavor is chocolate and we want to print only if the flavor is vanilla. So now if I refresh, then yeah, nothing gets printed because my flavor is chocolate and we want to ch we are checking against vanilla which is which will return false now if you want to run else if the above statement is not true then what should run so let's say we want to run no the flavor is not vanilla now if i refresh yeah because my flavor is chocolate and uh, we are checking against vanilla then else statement will run if the above statement is false. So it prints no, the flavor is not vanilla. So this is a simple code structure that is very helpful in, uh, in our coding language and uh, we'll definitely use it in our future demos. Functions are very important concept in JavaScript because to listen to any event uh, and execute something, we rely heavily on functions. Functions are a line of code that can execute on demand. It's a way to package functionality that can be reused. It is an alternative to writing the same logic repeatedly. To write a function, we start with a function keyword and then uh, the name of the function with followed by open and close brackets and then uh, inside the curly brackets we write the code statements to understand this clearly let's go into the code now uh, to to add two numbers we can simply uh, say to let a equals to 10 and let b equals to 20 now if we do console.log a and plus b now if we refresh maybe the answer 30 but how do how to get uh but how to how can we we can package this logic into functions so if we create a function the function keyword and we name the function print or better say add and we move all of this logic into our function body. Now if we save and refresh, then nothing is printed because function only execute on demand. And right now we are not executing. To execute this, let's say we add, we have to write the name of the function followed by the open and close brackets. And let's say I add a console.log before Add. So even if you are declaring the function above, the console statement will be, will be executed earlier and then add. So if I run, so before add is printed first and then 30. 
all right so now we have discussed about how to create functions now but still this piece of code is not reusable because it can only do a sum of 30 to make this reusable we have to use a concept called arguments now functions with the open close brackets can get variables which can which whose values can be set at a time of executing the function so let's say we make two arguments a and b in this case and we can move this and when we call the function we provide these values as an arguments so 10 and 20 now if we refresh then we see the answer is same now we can same use this logic to let's say add 30 and 20 plus 50 now we can again use this to add 120 and maybe 100 and 200 which will be 300 so that's how we can make our code reusable by functions so i think it's clear like why functions are a very important concept now what if we want to get the value that we have computed right now we are only printing the value that we compute but what if we want to save that value in a, in a reference so we can use a statement called return which will return the value after computing to our variable so we execute add and we create a function sum and now the value returned when executing add will be saved in sum because we're returning a plus b and if you console dot log sum and refresh now we have 50 so i think uh, we have discovered a lot about functions and how we can use the logic how we can pass arguments uh, this will help us understanding the future concepts when we discuss about DOM manipulation and event handling.